The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The proceeding will start shortly.
Order, order. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Elliot Coburn to move the motion. Thank you, Sir Roger. It's a pleasure to stand under your chairmanship. And I beg to move that this House has considered e petition 602171 relating to the safety of the COVID 19 vaccines. Uh, on behalf of the Petitions Committee, I will read out the prayer of this petition, which states that there has been a significant increase in heart attacks and related health issues since the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines. This needs immediate and full scientific investigation to establish if there's any possible link with the COVID-19 vaccination rollout. It is the duty of government to ensure that the prescribed medical interventions of its response to coronavirus are safe. We believe that the recent and increasing volume of data relating to cardiovascular problems since the COVID-19 vaccine rollout began is enough to warrant a full public inquiry. This petition has amassed over 107,000 signatures, including signatories from my own car short and a Wallington constituency. And I'd like to first begin by putting on record my gratitude to the petitions committee clerks and the team behind the scenes for organising today's debate but also particularly the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, or MHRA, who met with me recently to brief me on their vaccine safety surveillance strategy. Now, Sir Roger, throughout the course of my speech, I'll be pointing out why I do not think that the government should be launching a public inquiry into vaccine safety. I think it would be a waste of taxpayers' money, and I do not think it is necessary for reasons that I will go through throughout the course of my speech. But just to give a bit of background, Sir Roger, the COVID-19 vaccine has been at the centre of four previous e-petitions debates here in Westminster Hall, as well as the subject of many parliamentary debates, questions and committee work since the pandemic hit. I think it's worth remembering that for the first 26 months of the pandemic, over 178,000 people across the UK died within 28 days of a positive test for COVID-19. And it remains my position that vaccination is the single most effective way to reduce deaths and severe illness from COVID-19. Over 53 million people in the UK have received at least their first COVID-19 vaccine. And I would like to put on record my thanks to the amazing staff and indeed the volunteers who contributed to this gargantuan operation, which was a shining example of effective national collaboration. Indeed, I'll go so far as to say that as part of our public inquiry into COVID, I would urge the government to look at how this was such a success and how we can learn from the success of the vaccine rollout and apply it in future circumstances. Now, of course, it is... I will give, gladly give way. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend. He's obviously done a lot of preparation for this debate. Can I ask him whether... A part of that preparation includes having looked at the Oracle films Safe and Effective, A Second Opinion, which was uh, uh, produced about a month ago and has already had one, more than one million views online and most people think is highly persuasive. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for that intervention. I've not uh, seen the publication he mentions. I have read a lot of the significant amounts of material that have been shoved through my constituency office door by a large number of anti-vax protesters in my own constituency who have fly-posted my office on no less than a dozen occasions, intimidating my 18-year-old apprentice and the people who live above my constituency office. Uh, and considering the content of that literature includes climate change denial, moon landing denial, etc., etc., I'm inclined to ignore their content completely. Now, of course, it's impossible, as I've said, Sir Roger, to vaccinate every person in this country, and nor should it be thrust upon people without their consent. People have a right to know what is being put in their bodies and the autonomy to make the decision on whether or not to take a vaccination. As such, it's not only the job of the state to ensure that vaccines are safe for use and continually reviewed, but also that knowledge of why it is safe and effective is communicated well to our constituents. And with that in mind, I want to briefly outline the steps taken to review the safety of COVID-19 vaccines pre-rollout and the continuous monitoring that happens um, to the safety of vaccines going forward. All vaccines must be tested through a series of clinical trials to establish their efficacy and safety and have a product license before they can be made available for widespread use in humans. The MHRA is responsible for regulating all medicines and medical devices in the UK by ensuring that they work and are acceptably safe. 
Starting in 2020, a dedicated team of MHRA scientists and clinicians carried out, carried out a rigorous scientific and detailed review of all the available data in the development of COVID-19 vaccines, including from laboratory preclinical studies, clinical trials, manufacturing and quality controls, product sampling and testing of the final vaccine, as well as considering the conditions for its safe supply and distribution. In early June 2020, the MHRA set up an independent expert working group to begin some of the most important safety work going forward. In August 2020, a second working group was formed with different expertise, this time to advise the MHRA on the benefits and risks of the vaccines in development. Formed from 48 experts from outside the MHRA, these groups included virologists, epidemiologists, immuno immunologists and toxicologists. In September 2020, the MHRA started preparing laboratories for independent batch testing of the vaccine. Although the vaccine manufacturers carried out their own comprehensive testing regimes on the batches of products they produce, it is of vital importance that tests focusing on safety and quality are conducted independently as well. And in the UK, the independent testing is performed by the National Institute for Biological Standards and Control, which is part of the MHRA. Before any batch testing can reach the public, NA NIBSC must conduct a rigorous assessment to check that it is consistent with characteristics derived from results from batches previously shown to be safe and effective clinical trials or routine clinical use. And this work began in November 2020. COVID-19 vaccines were developed in a coordinated way that allows some stages of the assessment processes to happen in parallel, allowing the producers and regulators to condense the time normally needed. And this rolling review allowed the MHRA to review data as it became available from ongoing studies. Rather than waiting, I will give way. He's talking about the independence of the MHRA, and I very much hope he's right about that. Is he aware that the MHRA is itself overwhelmingly funded by the pharmaceutical companies? Who they, uh, which they regulate. And does he have any concerns about the objectivity of this work? Uh, no, I've seen nothing, um, Sir Roger, to concern me about the independence of the MHRA. Uh, indeed, I've seen a group of anti-vax protesters outside the House today holding up signs saying, vaccines kill, um, would you not believe that pharmaceutical companies kill? Well, it seems a bit of a strange business model to me, Sir Roger, for a pharmaceutical company to kill off everyone that they're trying to administer a vaccine to. I've, so I've seen absolutely nothing um, to concern me that the MHRA has any, um, has any problems with independence. Uh, and indeed, as I was saying, regarding to the ongoing studies, previous vaccines have had to wait for a full package um, and each stage to be finished before it can move on to the next stage. But this is one of the reasons that COVID-19 was allowed to be developed at such speed. It wasn't cutting any corners. It just changed the model. And Pfizer and BioNTech fed the MHRA data to be assessed even before the final clinical submission in November 2020. And once submitted, scientific and clinical experts robustly and thoroughly reviewed the data with scientific rigour, looking at all aspects, from the laboratory studies to the clinical trials and more. This includes assessing the level of protection it provides and for how long for, as well as the safety and stability and how it needs to be stored. On top of this, the MHRA also have a range of experts inspecting the sites used across the whole life cycle of the vaccine from its initial development in a lab to its manufacture and its distribution once approved. The inspectors work to legislation that incorporates internationally recognised clinical standards. The MHRA also seeks advice from the Commission on Human Medicines, the government's independent advisory body who critically assess the data before advising the UK government on safety, quality and effectiveness of any potential vaccine. So, Roger, I wish I could delve deeper into the specifics of how and why vaccines work, but I think we could be here all night. But I don't want to duplicate the work that has been done in other debates. Nevertheless, I hope I have managed to succinctly demonstrate the rigorous scientific testing that occurs prior to a vaccine being distributed in the UK. However, the main premise of much of the literature that um, has been distributed about COVID-19 um, uh, and its impact and it's on the, on the nationwide, uh, nationwide rollout needs looking into as well. As part of its statutory functions, the MHRA continually monitors the use of vaccines to ensure their benefits continue to outweigh any risks. 
This monitoring strategy is continuous, proactive, and based on a wide range of information sources with a dedicated team of scientists reviewing information daily to look for safety issues or unexpected events. Well, and I will give way. I uh, thank my honourable friend for giving way. He's making a good speech. And um, my constituent, uh, Gareth Eve, lost his wife, only age 44, Lisa Shaw, uh, as a result of the vaccine. Um, the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, he's not an anti-vaxxer. Uh, and uh, while this debate is, is broad, uh, on the, broad on the broad issue, would he actually agree with me that, on, particularly on when we're looking at things like how families get compensation, um, how uh, they, those things are looked at, we could do actually things around that side of things much better, even if he doesn't agree with a full public inquiry looking into the entire, the entire body of it, because so many families... Um, including my constituent, have been left um, without uh, that support and waiting for it for a very long period of time. Okay, that honourable members wish to represent their constituents, but interventions must be interventions and not speeches. Elico. Thank you, Roger, and I'm grateful to my honourable friend, and I am very sorry to hear of the case of his constituent, and I do agree that when it comes to compensation and it comes to... Um, uh, uh, me measures when things go wrong. Absolutely, I do agree that we do need, to, do need to look at that. Of course, no vaccine is without risk. No medicine at all is without risk. Um, but that is the balance that we, that's the balance that we must weigh up when deciding to take decisions over our own health. Um, if I could return, Sir Roger, to the core of the, um, core of the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine and how it's monitored. Uh, core to this work is the self-reporting, of course, um, of any adverse effects of post-vaccination by individuals and an active surveillance of particular groups um, of adverse events. And this is well known as the yellow card scheme. And I met recently with representatives of the MHRE to be briefed on their vaccine safety surveillance strategy. And MHRE surveillance strategy has four main pillars. Firstly, an enhanced passive surveillance through observed versus expect, expected analysis. MHRA perform enhanced statistical data generated through the yellow card scheme to evaluate observed versus expected event reports in order to determine whether more events are occurring after vaccination than might be expected ordinarily. And this assists the MHRA in identifying when and where vaccine-related side effects are signaled. Secondly, they conduct rapid psychoanalysis and ecological analysis. Now, this is to supplement the yellow card scheme, which relies on direct reporting. Uh, so the MHRA also analyse anonymised electronic healthcare records, particularly by way of the CPRD um, or on data set, which captures, from, uh, which captures data from 13 mil mil million registered GP patients in the UK. Now, this will track a range of theoretical side effects in order to detect safety signals. The MHRA also perform ecological analysis to monitor trends in high-priority vaccination population cohorts, for example, increased trends amongst the elderly. Thirdly, targeted active monitoring, and this is where the MHRA has developed a new voluntary follow-up platform for a randomly selected group of those vaccinated through the NHS. And this group is contacted at, at set intervals to determine the frequency and severity of any vaccine side effects. And finally, formal epi epidemi oh, I cannot say the word, Sir Roger. <laughs> epidemiological studies. Um, the above methods detect signals from and patterns, but do not necessarily confirm vaccine causation. As such, where necessary, formal epi epi epidemiological studies are, are undertaken to solidify casual links. Now, as of the 28th of September 2022 for the UK, 173,381 yellow cards have been reported for the Pfizer BioNTech. 246,393 have been reported for the AstraZeneca, 42,436 for the Moderna, 14 for Novavax, and 1,848 have been reported where the brand of the vaccine was not specified. For Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and Moderna, the reporting rate is around two to five yellow cards per 1,000 doses administered. But it is important to note because the use of the yellow card scheme has been, um, has been put out as an example of why vaccines don't work. But the yellow card scheme is a self-reporting system. It cannot be used to prove a causal link between reported symptoms and damage caused by potential damage caused. The reported reaction could have occurred regardless of the vaccine or the person reporting could indeed not have any knowledge of the relationship between that symptom and the vaccine. 
And it may have, have occurred even if the person had not been vaccinated altogether. I could get on the phone right now to the yellow card scheme and say, I've got a side effect from a vaccine and just completely make it up. There is no verification done at the yellow card scheme. I will give away. Give away again. Um, I mean, I think he's suggesting that perhaps the yellow card numbers exaggerate the potential effect, negative effect of the vaccines. Is he aware that the independent MHRA actually itself suggests that uh, reporting of vaccine injuries have been underreported by up to by potentially ten, uh, up one in ten? So there might be ten times more vaccine-related injuries than the yellow card scheme itself reports. So surely, if there's an exaggeration, it's in the opposite direction to the one he's suggesting. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for that intervention, and I am aware of that. But the point I'm making here is that the, that the yellow card scheme is not, a, is not a determining factor of damage done by the vaccine. There is no way to prove a causal link. Um, the reported reaction could have happened anyway. And that due to the worldwide awareness of COVID and blanket me media coverage over multiple years and the impact that it's had on all of our lives, it is bound to increase um, reports um, from previous vaccine rollouts. Now, most reports relate to injection site reactions. Now, this, it, for example, includes things like a sore arm and generalized symptoms such as flu-like symptoms, illness, headache, chills, fatigue, nausea, fever, dizziness, weakness, aching muscles, or rapid heartbeat. Now, generally, these reactions are not associated with more serious illness and likely reflect an expected normal immune response to vaccines. There have, of course, been some occurrences of inflammatory conditions of the heart following a vaccination from COVID-19. Fortunately, these are incredibly rare incidences, and for Pfizer, the suspected my myocarditis reporting rate is 12 reports per million doses. For suspected um, pericardius, including viral pericardius and infective pericardius, the overall reporting rate is eight reports per million. For Moderna, this is 42 per million, um, and for AstraZeneca, it's four per, four per million. Now, these events reported are typically mild with individuals usually recovering within a short time and following standard treatment and rest. The benefits of the vaccines in protecting against COVID-19 and serious complications associated with the virus far outweigh any currently known side effects. And I understand one of the biggest concerns about vaccine safety going forward is the potential influence it has on excess death. Now, of course, um, the excess mortality rates have, um, have increased. However, there is no evidence to empirically prove a casual relationship between a spike in excess, de excess deaths and COVID-19. Now, I'm not clinically trained, so I don't wish to preach in this debate, but there are mo multiple drivers that could have caused this spike, including the impact of missed and delayed diagnosis earlier in the pandemic, as well as, of course, the long-term impact of COVID-19 on people who contracted it. And this was something that was confirmed to me by the MHRA. And in one study this year, researchers estimated how often COVID-19 leads to cardi cardiovascular problems. They found that people who had the disease faced a substantially increased risk for 20 cardiovascular conditions um, in the year after infection with coronavirus. Researchers say that these complications can happen even in people who seem to have completely recovered from a mild infection. And with millions and perhaps even billions of people having been infected with the virus, Clinicians are wondering whether the pandemic will be followed by a cardiovascular aftershock. Now, again, I'm not clinically trained, Sir Roger, but I wanted to touch upon this to provide some food for thought because I understand that the issue around excess mortality rates is, of course, of extreme importance. Now, easily the biggest elephant in the room whilst discussing the safety of, COVID of the COVID-19 vaccine and the potential inquiry into its safety, however, um, is that the government has already announced a public inquiry into its handling of the COVID-19 pandemic as a whole. Now, since the government announced this and responded to the petition, the terms of reference um, for the UK COVID-19 public inquiry have been published by the Cabinet Office. And one of the aims of that inquiry is to examine the response of the health and care sector across the UK, including the development, delivery and impact of therapeutics and vaccines. The first preliminary hearing of module one of the inquiry took place just a few weeks ago with the second due to take place next Monday. And the inquiry will further announce um, modules in 2023. 
Now, these are expected to cover both system and impact issues, including vaccines, therapeutics, and antiviral treatment. So I would appreciate if the minister could shed a bit more light on the aim of the content of the modules that will be investigating the vaccines, and perhaps give more details on how, the peti on how the others um, can contribute towards it, including those who sign this petition. So Roger, I will bring my comments to a close, um, because I don't want to take time from other members who wish to contribute. But just to conclude, I appreciate that for some people, the question of whether the COVID-19 vaccine uh, is safe is still up in the air. And I understand that my comments may not easily persuade them otherwise. However, we know that vaccines are the best way to protect against COVID-19. And it has already saved tens of thousands of lives. So I hope that I can offer some reassurance to those who are unsure that taking the right steps to ensure that vaccines were safe prior to rollout and continue to be monitored for their safety and effectiveness does take place. Likewise, I hope that they can be reassured by the Minister in, in her remarks that the government is including, its, including an extensive investigation into the vaccine as part of its existing COVID-19 public inquiry and that separate investigation will not be necessary. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 602171 relating to the safety of COVID-19 vaccines. Nobody from the opposition benches. No. Nope. Um, Danny Kruger. Very great, Sir Roger, and it's a pleasure to serve under you. And I'm, uh, I'm very grateful. I'm grateful to, to my honourable friend, the member for Carshalton and Wallington. He gave a he gave a very good defence of the of the vaccine programme and of the MHRA, and I. I, I respect that. Um, I do regret his, his, his response to my honourable friend, member for Christchurch, I think, who, who, who raised the point about uh, medical expertise, which cast some doubt on the vaccines. Um, and, and my friend chose to smear all opponents of the vaccine programme. Um, there, of course, are lunatics out there who are making absurd and outrageous claims, but I do suggest that there are many reasonable and respectable people who have anxieties about the vaccine program and, uh, and particularly, of course, in their own cases, those of themselves and their families who have suffered as a result of the program. Um, and I, I, I'm a member of the, the All Party Parliamentary Group, my friend, member for Christchurch chairs, looking at vaccine injuries. And we met, I think there was the first meeting of the APPG last week in committee room uh, in Portcullis House, and we met there. It was only, a, I'm afraid, a tiny handful of colleagues, but well over 100 members of the public attended, which isn't the usual uh, story for, a, uh, for an APPG. And I felt somewhat ashamed on behalf of Parliament. This was the first time that those members of uh, the public, families of the bereaved, themselves injured uh, citizens, had had the opportunity to be in a room with, with members of this House. And I'm very pleased that we are now having this debate, and I'm particularly pleased to, that, that, that we have the opportunity for members of the public to hear from the Minister about about this topic. Um, and I should say to members of the public watching that we have here a very good minister who is genuinely committed to, uh, to, to health and to public health uh, and has shown a real interest in, in this topic and in the effect of, of COVID policy since before when she was a backbench MP. And I would say that the UK as a whole, and while many questions need to be answered about, about our COVID response, is by no means the worst offender. We're not Canada or New Zealand or China places where they think they can exterminate COVID by depriving the population of the most basic civil liberties. Um, but we still do have, I'm afraid, much to ask, questions to ask ourselves and even much to be ashamed of. I'm particularly ashamed, and I put it on record in hindsight, of my own vote to dismiss the care workers uh, who didn't want to take the vaccine. Uh, and I very much hope that the 40,000 care workers who lost their jobs can be reinstated and indeed compensated. Uh, now, a group of us, including, I think, the, the Minister, held out against compulsory vaccination of health workers when that was proposed by the government last winter. And, uh, and that resistance, I think, turned the tide to a degree on government policy. Uh, and, we, and we emerged from, the, from, from lockdowns quicker than we might have otherwise. And yet we still have this policy of mass vaccination. And I, want to, I, I do want to query, query this on behalf of, of constituents who have written to me. And my, my query starts with this simple point. In October uh, 2020, when the vaccine was getting ready for rollout, Kate Bingham, the head of the vaccines agency, said this, there's going to be no vaccination of people under 18. It's an adult-only vaccine for people over 50, yeah. focusing on health workers and care home workers and the vulnerable. Now, why was it extended to the whole population? 
I don't think we've ever had a completely satisfactory answer to that, to that question. Uh, and I raise it because my concern is that in extending the vaccination programme, it, it became an operation in public persuasion, an operation in which dissent is unhelpful or even immoral, justifying suppression, even vilification of those who raise concerns. Well, Happy to give way. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. Would he also question, unlike any other vaccine, um, the vaccine was actually given to people who'd got natural immunity because they'd actually contracted and provably contracted the virus, and so they would have had natural immunity. Why were those people vaccinated? My honourable friend is absolutely right. The best vaccine against COVID is COVID, and, uh, and many people were indeed naturally immune, and, and I think there are questions to be asked about the effects of vaccination on the, immunity, on the immune system. Um, so, now I do understand why. My, my honourable friend, the member for Carl and Wallingford, made, made, made a very you know, understandable point about the importance of, uh, a, 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 of resisting misinformation. And certainly, there, as, I, as I mentioned, many crazy theories out there which we need to not, not, not give credence to. Um, if we're talking about a programme of vaccinating the population, it is important that the public is persuaded to do what the government wants them to do. And I understand why the government should have a public health information campaign along those lines. But it, it is an essential principle of medical ethics that people need to be able to give their informed consent before any treatment. And I do worry about how we can say that consent was fully informed in all cases. Throughout there has been not, I wouldn't say deliberate, but there has been some misinformation, it turned possibly accidental, in favour of the vaccine. We can tell this with hindsight. Um, perhaps the most egregious, and my, the, the doctor that my honourable friend mentioned earlier presented on this to the, uh, to the APBG last week, Dr Malhotra, the claim that the vaccine is 95% effective. But what that means is simply the relative risk, not the actual absolute risk, uh, reduction in risk to an individual. The absolute risk reduction is really less than 1%. There was a widespread claim that the vaccine stops transmission, so people should take the jab to protect other people. We were all told that. We all believed that for many months. Last month, we heard from Pfizer that, that, Pfizer, that their vaccine was never tested to see whether it would stop transmission. Uh, and yet we had the notorious claim by, uh, by Professor Chris Whitty that even though the vaccine brought no benefit to children, children should be vaccinated to protect wider society. Now, I'm all for thinking about society, not the individual, uh, Sir Roger, but that, again, it feels to me a profound break with medical ethics. And a lot of people are asking what the vaccine does to children and young people. And Dr Whitty is right that the benefit to healthy children seems to be essentially nil. Uh, and yet there are genuine questions to be asked. And I do not verify these questions. I merely ask them on behalf of my constituents. How do we explain the increase in the rates of myocarditis, the increase in heart attacks and the excess deaths among young people? And indeed, in the general population, it is plausible, not definitive, but plausible, uh, that the vaccine is responsible for more harms than we know about. And I mentioned in my intervention earlier uh, that we know from the yellow card scheme that up to one in 200 people vaccinated report an adverse reaction. And that is in itself bad enough. But we also know uh, that yellow card reports, uh, the, the, the adverse effects are significantly underreported through the yellow card scheme. Based on the MHRA's own research, there may be as many as 10 times more serious adverse reactions, serious ones, not just any ones. There may be 10 times more serious adverse reactions than the yellow card system shows. Happy to give way. Does he agree with me that it's not? Um, it's, it's perhaps important for the minister to explain how those people who ha say they've experienced damage from the vaccine can have themselves heard, not just via the yellow card scheme, not just via the module in the public or existing public inquiry, and not just an application for vaccine damage compensation. That there needs to be more meaningful ways in which people can engage um, with, with their experiences of, of damage. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Aidan, I, and I absolutely agree. And I think that, that, that today is a very important moment for, for the Minister to hear on, from uh, members here on behalf of residents. And I would encourage a far greater engagement with, uh, with uh, citizens who have themselves suffered from uh, vaccine damage or even lost loved ones through it. Now, I mentioned these, these rather terrifying uh, facts, and there may be innocent explanations for them, and I, I very much hope they are. If these are conspiracy theories... We need them to be comprehensively and courteously debunked. So I have four questions for the Minister to close, Sir Roger. First, will she review the vaccination of children? We know that children have strong naturally acquired immunity and that the chance of death from COVID for a healthy child is, only, is one in two million. So I believe that we should follow other countries like Denmark, 
and stop vaccinating children altogether, but I invite the Minister to consider reviewing that aspect of the policy. Second, will she make representations in government and with Baroness Hallett that the terms of reference for her inquiry should be broadened to explicitly include the efficacy and safety of the vaccines? And I hear what my honourable friend says is absolutely right, that the inquiry does include reference to the, uh, to the vaccination programme and its effects. And he may well be right that that is sufficient and that the review will properly consider the, just the, the topics that we're discussing today. I hope that that is the case. I, I, but I think that needs to be made more explicit. And so I'd invite the Minister to comment. Happy to give way. I actually wrote to Baroness Hallett asking her to make, ensure that it was specifically in the terms of reference that it should cover the issue of safety of, of vaccines and the impact of vaccines. And as a result of not just my representations but representations from others, the terms of reference were amended to make it quite clear that vaccines and the impact of vaccines and the potential damage of vaccines is included within the terms of reference. Thank you for that clarification. It concerns me that it took his representations to even get the, the, vaccine, the, the, the effect of the vaccines considered by the inquiry. And I, I suggest we need to go further and talk about efficacy and safety, not just the impact. So I think we need to be quite explicit about what we want answers to. These, these issues need to be directly covered. Um, now, this inquiry, I think, I think we do need the public inquiry to consider this because of the compromised nature of medical reg regulation in our country. And I mentioned earlier that the MHRA is funded by the pharmaceutical companies who produce the drugs and vaccines that it regulates. And this might be, there might be some universe in which this makes sense, but I don't think this is that universe. I don't think it's right. Um, and third, we need to do more, a lot more for the injured and bereaved. And as, my, as the Honourable Lady mentioned, I agree with all of my... Uh, my friend from Christchurch's uh, recommendations, and we'll hear from him shortly about what needs to be done to raise the threshold for compensation for the injured and the speed of payouts. And I also agree with him that we need clinics for people with adverse reactions, just as we do for people with long COVID. And finally, following this, we need to change the power and balance. I am sorry on behalf of Parliament that this is the first proper debate we've had on this subject. I regret that victims and families have had to struggle so hard to get the engagement of the system. I hope the Minister will agree to meet with some of the people who are here today and, and, other, and other representatives of, 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 of families affected by, by the vaccines um, with a prop, for a proper exchange of information and ideas. And I hope that she will request that Dame June Rain of the MHRA meets with them as well, rather than, I'm afraid to say, ignoring letters <coughs> for months. And I want to hope that, uh, end by hoping that with the new government that takes over this week, the current Minister herself has only just been recently appointed, will stay in post and that we can start a new chapter uh, in the story of COVID. No more remote power telling people what to do. Let's put truth and justice back into our public life and restore trust in the experts we rely on. Thank you, Sir Roger. We should be all right, we should be all right for time, but uh, bear in mind there are three people wishing to speak and I need to start the wind-ups at 5.30. Sir Christopher Cho. Sir Roger, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And, uh, I am, as has been referred to now, the, the chair of the all-party parliamentary uh, group for the victims of COVID-19 vaccine uh, damage. And we've had, the, the group is now set up and, and running, and, and we had this uh, enormously well-supported meeting um, in uh, Port Callis House last, last Thursday. I agree with the legitimate concerns of the 100,000 plus people who signed uh, this petition. And I share their belief that the recent and increasing volume of data relating to cardiovascular problems um, is enough of concern to warrant an inquiry into safety. And although, as I've referred to, the, the big Hallett inquiry into COVID-19 is going to cover, I think, a lot of this ground, that won't be for many years. And in the meantime, uh, people are being encouraged to have more and more uh, boosters, and they want to know, understandably, uh, what the impact of those boosters is upon their health and what the potential risks um, and rewards are. Um, it's, I, I, as chairman of the TPPG, and, and uh, t having taken an issue in this subject for about, about a year and produced a private member's bill, another one of which I hope to be able to produce, uh, have a, a second reading for uh, ne next month, I've come across the findings of coroners' reports up and down the country. Those coroners have found that deaths have been caused directly by COVID-19 vaccines. 
And I've spoken to uh, some of the uh, bereaved, and indeed um, I, I spoke to um, the, the, the gentleman who was referred to by my honourable friend, who, who attended our meeting on Thursday, whose wife was a journalist in, in, in Newcastle. And I've seen in my own eyes the suffering that those people are going through as bereaved or as people who are still suffering the ill effects of the, the adverse uh, reactions. And I'm sorry that my honourable friend, in, in, in introducing this debate, didn't really have much to say about the people whom we know have suffered death or serious injury as a result of the, the vaccines. If I may say to him, I think he showed himself to be rather the victim of producer capture, uh, and the producer in this case being the MHRA. He doesn't seem to have allowed his researches to go far further than the MHRA. Has he, for example, uh, looked at what's been happening in, in Germany, uh, where the German, um, they, they have an institute called the Paul Ehrlich Institute, and that is the German regulator responsible for vaccine safety. And on the 20th of July, they confirmed that uh, one in 5,000 people were affected by a serious effect after a vaccination. And uh, the, that, is, that reflected also a finding that they published in, earlier in the, in the year in which uh, they tried to raise the alert that one in 5,000 vaccinated people has a serious side effect such as heart muscle inflammation. And statistically, they said every tenth person must expect a severe consequence from having a course of you know, three or four uh, vaccines. And the, the, the Institute uses the WHO definition of a serious adverse event, meaning one which results in hospitalisation, is life-threatening or life-changing. And after a four-dose course, the risk of a report to their system of a serious adverse effect is one in 1,250. Now, that is serious information coming from the regulator in another country which is highly respected for the quality of its health care. And isn't it interesting also that the number of adverse reports uh, referred to there um, is far fewer than the number of adverse reports which led to the 1976 swine flu vaccine uh, being withdrawn. Uh, some members may recall um, in 1976, uh, Gerald Ford, President of the United States at the time, was panicked uh, by, a, by swine flu into organizing a, a vaccination campaign. And when ad reports emerged of suspected adverse reactions, including heart attacks, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and uh, there were 53 reported uh, deaths, people began to worry about the safety of the vaccine. And the government halted that mass vaccination uh, program in December of that same year. So in that case, the government acted um, on far fewer adverse events than we have been talking about during this uh, debate and decided that it was it, it, no longer in, in the, the balance of risk and reward um, was that it was too risky to continue with that vaccination uh, program. So let's, let's look at these facts and, and let's not be um, just uh, beholden to the MHR a, and I, if, if this was a debate about the MHRA, um, Sir Roger, I would have masses of material which I could bring before uh, the, the, us for, for, for that. But um, what, I, what I'd also say is, is this, that um, the government seems to be in denial about the risks of these vaccines. Only this morning, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for England was on the radio saying the boosters were, and I quote, perfectly safe and effective. But, Sir Roger, they are not perfectly safe. And there's a question about whether they're effective, but that's, another, that's for another d debate. That they are not perfectly safe is now admitted by the government. Indeed, the UK Health Security Agency has issued a guide to the COVID-19 autumn a booster. And you, Sir Roger, may have seen a, a copy of this. Uh, it comes out with the request that you go and get another booster from your GP. Unfortunately, the covering letter 
from the NHS makes no reference to any risks associated with the vaccine. But if one actually looks at this document, which is included within the envelope, it says a guide to the autumn booster, and one goes down and it talks about serious side effects. C cases of inflammation of the heart called myocarditis or pericarditis have been reported very rarely after the, both the Pfizer and Moderna COVID-19 vaccines. These cases have been seen mostly in younger men and within several days of vaccination. Most of the people have felt better and recovered quickly following rest and simple uh, treatments. Uh, and then it says uh, you should seek medical advice. What it doesn't say is what happens to those people who do not recover. And that is what I would like to concentrate on in the remain, remainder of my remarks. Those people, if they are disabled to the extent of 60% or more, may be eligible for payments under the Vaccine Damage Payment Scheme. And they might get £120,000. Um, but that scheme in itself is not fit for purpose because it talks about terms of, of disability, uh, which is not necessarily um, well described in, in the context of an autoimmune condition, such as those who are suffering from the consequences of COVID-19 uh, vaccine uh, damage. And what about all those people who are only 59% disabled? Uh, there's no financial help for them. And I think even more worrying for, for many, there's no specific medical help. The government refuses to provide specialist help for these vaccine victims. While it has set up long COVID clinics, uh, vaccine victims are being ignored. I've asked parliamentary questions about this and I haven't been able to get a satisfactory answer as to why there are no clinics for those victims of vaccine uh, damage. And as a result of the government's behaviour, victims are increasingly you know, telling their, their loved ones and, and, and neighbours and friends about their circumstances. And as a result of that, we are seeing a much lower rate of application to, jo to get booster vaccines. And the reason for that is because uh, the government can't suppress information going around um, in, in, amongst ordinary uh, people, even though there is very little about this in the mainstream uh, media. But m m many people now would not touch a booster with a barge pole, and I include myself amongst those. I, I'm not anti-vax. I had my first two vaccines, but from all that I've seen and known, uh, know about this, I, I, I think that the, the, the increase in um, boosters is now, for many people, uh, counterproductive, and for some people it's also uh, dangerous. Uh, and so uh, we need to uh, take into account uh, what is happening on the ground, people are becoming increasingly vaccine hesitant. Large, large numbers of doctors and health professionals are now calling for a complete halt to the vaccination programme because the risks outweigh uh, the, the benefits. I give way to my right honourable friend. And Sir Roger, is there is a fundamental difference between these kind of vaccines and vaccination per se. Yeah. Vaccination per se has saved hundreds of thousands, millions of lives here and elsewhere. But these vaccines are qualitatively different. Science matters, but much matters more. Absolutely right. And of course, as you will know, Sir Roger, I think the, in the United States, they changed the definition of vaccine. Because what we always used to understand as a vaccine was something where you had a small element of the, um, the thing about which, against which you were being vaccinated put into your system so that your system could react against a small amount and then if you were exposed to a large amount it would also uh, react against. These vaccines do not use the raw material like old vaccines. Therefore, in, in many senses, it's a misnomer to describe them as vaccines at all. But again, this information is not really out there in the, in the, in, uh, amongst, the, amongst the public any more than the, the fact that the booster vaccines have not been tested on humans at all during the, 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 the studies on, on them, I think, but only on uh, mice. So people are being used as, um, as victims of, uh, for, for experimentation in, in this, and that's why people are getting worried. So I, I finish on this, this point that Oracle Films 
their film, Safe and Efficient, A Second Opinion, is available on YouTube, and it sets out in a... And I, and I make no apology for the fact that I participate in that film, um, as Sir Roger, um, and it sets out um, a, a different view about um, the safety of these vaccines. And I'm not saying we should ban all vaccines, so COVID-19 have a complete halt, but what I am saying is that there's an urgent need for the government to get to grips with this issue before more and more people are duped into having uh, vaccines which they probably don't need, are not going to do any good to them, and will present risks to their health. It's Mr. Bridgen and Mrs. Elphick to keep confine their remarks. Order. Could I ask Mrs. Mr. Bridgen and Mrs. Elphick to confine their remarks to uh, six minutes, please? Mr. Bridgen. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir Roger. It's a pleasure to serve on your chairmanship. I'll try and curtail my uh, remarks to six minutes. However, this is a hugely important debate, overdue, uh, and what we do know is that those people who've questioned the efficacy or safety of the vaccines have generally been cut, uh, cut down, uh, cancelled, and that's why uh, this is so important. Um, I don't claim to be any sort of expert, but my degree a long time ago was in genetics, behaviour and biochemistry, and science works by challenge and what we do know is that these the science behind these vaccines has not been allowed to challenge um, a study um, in the journal of american medical associations published included 7806 children aged five or younger who were followed for an average of 91.4 days after their first pfizer vaccination the study shows that one in 500 children under five years of age received a pfizer mRNA, messenger ribonucleic acid, COVID vaccine, were hospitalised with a vaccine injury, and one in 200 had symptoms ongoing for weeks or months afterwards. This is what the study has found. Um, would the Minister, uh, in response, uh, outline what the Government's current policy on, on vaccination and boosters is, and also outline what our current policy for the vaccination of, of children is? So it, half a percent of the children, so 40 out of the 7,806, um, had symptoms that were still ongoing, uh, so that it was of unknown significance at the end of the trial. That was a, a two- to four-month follow-up period. So half a percent of the children had an adverse uh, effect that lasted for weeks or months. T two cases, uh, the, the symptoms were uh, confirmed to have lasted longer uh, than 90 days. G uh, given this evidence... Um, Perhaps the Minister can explain to us why we're vaccinating healthy children who are at minimal risk from COVID. And surely that, this is in breach of the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm. We're not in a situation where we can ask young people to risk their lives to protect older people. That's, in a civilised society, that, that can't be the way it works, uh, Sir, Sir Roger, at all. According to the Independent uh, in April this year, more than 1,200 claims have been made to the Vaccine Damages Payment Scheme. Uh, which entitles successful applicants, as my uh, right honourable friend, for, the member for Christchurch, pointed out, for £120,000 if a causal link between vaccination and severe reaction culminating in injury or death is proven. Does the Minister recognise these figures? Um, Sarah Moore, a lawyer who represents 95 families seeking claims, said her clients felt silenced and ignored adding that they cannot speak about vaccine harm uh, or linked injuries without being accused of being anti-vax. What's the Minister's view on victims uh, being labelled as, as anti-vaxxers? Um, the Department of Health and Social Care commissioned research through the National Institute of Health Research. 1.6 million has been allocated for a programme to understand the rare condition of blood clotting with low platelets following vaccination for COVID-19. Does the Minister think this is sufficient? And is there this sufficient breadth of uh, investigation considering all the things we're finding out about these vaccines? Uh, where's the cost-benefit analysis by age group uh, for the vaccines, given the risks that they carry? Um, especially as, as the pharma companies are now admitting that the vaccine, uh, vaccination does not impact on transmission. And did the government at the time of the mandating vaccines for care workers and NHS workers know uh, that the, uh, the vaccines had not been tested to whether they actually prevented transmission at the time the mandates were, were brought in? Uh, the Florida Department of Health 
uh, Mr. Uh, Sir Roger, conducted an analysis through self-controlled case series, which is a technique originally developed to evaluate vaccine safety. This analysis found that uh, there is an 84% increase in the relative incidence of cardiac-related death, death amongst males 18 to 39 within 28 days following a messenger ribonucleic acid vaccination. And with a high level of global immunity to COVID-19, the benefit of vaccination is likely outweighed by this abnormally high risk of cardiac-related death amongst men in this age group. And the recommendation now in Florida is that they do not have vaccination of any male under the age of, of 40. Studying the safety and efficacy of any medications, including vaccines, is an important component of public health. That's the Surgeon General, Dr. Joseph Ladapo. Far less attention has been paid to safety and the concerns of many individuals have been dismissed. And these are important findings uh, that should be communicated to all Floridians. I would suggest, uh, Sir Roger, these are important findings that should be transmitted to everyone who's had a vaccine or is contemplating having, having a booster. I also had the, the pleasure of meeting Dr. Azim Malhotra last week at the APPG launch, and um, he made a very, very strong case that up to 90% of adverse vaccine reactions are actually not even being reported. And finally, I wish I had longer to speak. Uh, finally, the excess deaths we're suffering at the moment in this country, across Europe and in the Americas. What analysis is the government making of these excess deaths? But even a, even a casual glance at the data shows that there's a very strong correlation between vaccine uptake and the level of excess deaths being found in that, in that country. Surely we must have an investigation. These are tens of thousands of people who are dying more than we're expected. It's really, really important. And I think if we don't get this right, no one's going to believe we're going to lose trust in politicians and we're going to lose trust in our, in our medicine and our medical system. Thank you very much. Natalie Elphick. Order. <clears throat> Thank you, Sir Roger, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship in this important debate. Today's debate does show the importance of the petitions process in raising issues which may be contentious, may not reflect a majority view, but absolutely are essentially important nonetheless to explore. This petition has attracted more than 200 signatures in my constituency, in addition, I have written to health ministers on behalf of constituents a number of times on compensation and individual cases of harm. The COVID vaccine development was truly remarkable. The sharing of intellectual property, know-how and scientific endeavour, the rapidity of the regulatory process, the operational rollout across the entire country. We should rightly be proud of everything that was done to stop the COVID pandemic in its tracks. However, we are a considerable way on now since the vaccine development. Some sort of ongoing vaccination programme is currently expected to continue. The dust has now settled, yet concerns persist about a number of medical, regulatory and ethical issues, as has been set out already during this debate. So, Roger, I have had raised with me considered and researched concerns about issues including experiences from constituents. These include variations of the menopause cycle, including concerns about the long-term impact on fertility, whether people can have children. Cardiovascular concerns, muscle issues, including carpal tunnel syndrome, serious autoimmune responses which have been triggered, and much more besides. <coughs> It has been the case in the past that concerns about, for example, the MMR, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination, and had an adverse impact on the take-up before those concerns could be fully allayed. But it has also been the case that authorized regulate, regulated drugs have caused immeasurable harm and have had to be withdrawn. So, Roger, it seems to me that the concerns about this vaccine process have been mounting. It is my view that these issues must be considered and addressed, and they must not be ignored. <coughs> if we are to continue to ensure widespread support for a national vaccination program and to have confidence in this very, very important um, drug. I'd be grateful if the minister could provide assurance about how the government is considering and addressing these concerns, and that these concerns 
are being accepted and taken seriously. Thank you. For the Scottish National Party, Stephen Bonner, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Gale, it's a pleasure to see you in the chair today. And I com uh, commend the member for Per Shelton and Wallington on moving to be the motion on petition 602-171, safety of COVID vaccines. And I'd like to thank all those who have signed the petition, including 119 constituents of my own in Coatbridge, Chrysler and Bells Hill. And I'd also like to thank and place on record uh, all members who have contributed today uh, for thanks and the thought-provoking uh, sentiments that have been put across in the debate today. And I'm happy to attend and outline uh, my party's position in relation to COVID-19 vaccines and their safety. The COVID vaccine has indeed saved millions of lives, not just here in the UK, but across the world. In the first year of the vaccination programme, 19.8 million out of a potential 31.4 million COVID-19 deaths were prevented worldwide, according to estimates based on excess deaths from 185 countries and territories. In Scotland alone, the vaccine saved almost 28,000 lives. That's an estimated 86% of potential deaths being prevented in Scotland as a result of the vaccination uptake. Thousands of people in Scotland are still alive today because of the coronavirus vaccines. Dr Jim McMenamin, the Director of Health Protection Infection Services at Public Health Scotland said this important study shows that thanks to high vaccine uptake among the people of Scotland and early implementation, the COVID-19 vaccination programme is estimated to have saved more than 27,000 lives. Despite this, Mr Chairman, there has been a significant increase in heart attacks and other related illnesses since the COVID-19 vaccinations started to be distributed in 2021. To determine if there is any potential connection with the COVID-19 rollout, I believe this government must conduct an immediate and complete scientific investigation and ensure that the prescribed medical interventions of its response to coronavirus are indeed safe. Every vaccine used in the UK, as we know, will be subject to approval by the Independent Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. The vaccination programme has always been guided by the expert advice provided by the Joint Committee on vaccinations and immunisation. In Scotland, the Scottish Government is looking this year to maximise co-administration of boosters with flu vaccines, drawing on learning from previous winter camp vaccination campaigns. And I myself will take my booster when I'm called to do so, on top of the three vaccinations I have already taken. And after consideration and discussion with my own 14-year-old daughter, she has informed me that she will also be uh, taking her booster when the time comes as well, and I think that um, everybody should have the uh, individual basis to do, to do so. Everyone, everybody eligible for a COVID-19 vaccination will also be invited for a flu vaccine and can safely receive both vaccines at the same time in the same appointment in Scotland. The clinical trials of the vaccine have shown them to be effective and acceptably safe. However, as part of its statutory functions, the MHRA will continually monitor the use of vaccines to ensure their benefits continue to outweigh any risks. For example, initially during the pandemic, Mr Chairman, vaccines for pregnant women were suggested as a, at a risk. But as the MHRA did then and as they do now, they reassured the public. Their advice remains that the COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective during pregnancy and breastfeeding, and there is substantial evidence to support this advice. Scotland, I'll be happy to give away, sir. Before giving way, uh, he may not be aware, but there is actually contradictory evidence issued on two separate days, which one said yes, uh, pregnant women and breastfeeding women could have the vaccine, and then by another government body, it said that it wasn't safe and they weren't recommending it. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank the honourable member for his intervention. And I'm sure, no matter which uh, subject we were standing here discussing, we will have pros and cons and we'll have arguments for and against it for it. We believe in the institutions that govern our, our health bodies in Scotland and we believe that the health board in Scotland will make the right um, available advice to all our constituents and I thank him for his intervention. More than 11 billion jabs have been administered so far while John Hopkins University puts global COVID-19 re uh, related deaths at 6.5 million. 11 billion jabs have been administered. Although the vast majority of vaccinations do not result in serious adverse effects, there will, of course, be a small number of incidents where there will be serious problems, and they must be fully investigated. 
vaccination we believe is the best course of action because the danger of in injury from coronavirus significantly outweighs the chance of harm from vaccines. It is a cruel truth, Mr Chair, that some people will experience some adverse effects, including disability and death. And of course, we know that a grieving person whose partner passed away recently a result, uh, as a result of the AstraZeneca vaccine has now received the first payout under the UK's comp compensation mechanism. And we must recognise the significance of that. There are severe, legitimate claims of harm from the JAG and they must both be respected and listened to. This is vital to maintain faith in the UK's vaccine programme, both now and in the future. As those claiming themselves make clear, making claims is not about being anti-vaccine. Concerns are legitimate and we must listen and we must learn. An independent Scottish COVID-19 public inquiry has been set up by the Scottish Government to provide scrutiny on the handling of the pandemic and to learn important lessons. The input of bereaved families has been fundamental to developing the Scottish inquiry terms of reference and Scottish Government is committed to engagement with bereaved families and that will be long lasting. The terms of reference provide adequate breadth for the inquiry to consider the elements that came through strongly in stakeholder engagement. And it will be up to the new chair when appointed to decide how to investigate the issues listed in the terms of reference and it should not be assumed that a topic or group will be excluded from consideration simply because it is not explicitly referred to. And following consultation with all the devolved governments, the UK inquiry terms of reference include a number of areas of particular interest to the devolved governments. The Scottish Government look forward to engaging fully with the UK inquiry to identify the lessons that we all need to learn. Thank you very much, Chair. Opposition front bench, Andrew Gwynne. Thank you, Sir Roger, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I also want to uh, commend the way that the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Carsholton and Wallington, opened the debate uh, and uh, for uh, his uh, candid support for the vaccine programme. Uh, Sir Roger, at the start of September, we had a debate in this very Westminster Hall about the COVID-19 vaccine damage payment scheme. I'd like to begin this debate in the same way that I started that one, by saying that the COVID-19 vaccine is safe, effective and has saved countless lives. I and the entire Shadow Health and Social Care team remain extraordinarily grateful to those who sacrificed countless hours to facilitate our vaccine rollout. We stand here today debating this petition because of the vaccine. Without it, we would probably still be dialing in from our homes, me in Denton, uh, frantically trying to sort my dodgy Wi-Fi and battling my dog for custody of the study chair. Some 51 million people have been fully vaccinated and more than 150 million doses have been given in the United Kingdom. Without the vaccine and the extraordinary work of scientists, volunteers and NHS staff, we would not have been able to reclaim liberties which we were forced to forfeit over the course of the pandemic. As members from across the House will, will be aware of, any vaccine goes through rigorous and ongoing testing procedures. COVID-19 vaccines went through several stages of clinical trials before being approved and met strict independent standards for safety, quality and effectiveness. As I'm sure the Minister... Give I, I'll, I'll give way. <coughs> I thank the uh, Honourable Gentleman for, for giving way, but surely he's well aware of the, of the much publicised um, interview of um, a, a Pfizer representative by the European Parliament Committee there <coughs> only a couple of weeks ago, where they admitted they'd done no testing whatsoever to see whether, the, whether vaccination prevented transmission of the virus. Yes, I heard that. And of course, the issue here uh, is that we were protecting the lives of those people uh, who needed the uh, vaccine to be able uh, to get on with their day-to-day -day lives. The COVID vaccines 
did go through several stages of clinical trials before uh, it being approved. And I'm sure, as the Minister will make clear in her response, the MHRA continues to monitor the use of the vaccines to ensure that their benefits outweigh any risks. And that's an important fact. So I will give way. I hear, I hear what he says, but if the vaccines were so safe, why was it necessary for the vaccine manufacturers to seek an indemnity against liability for negligence from the government and the taxpayer? Well, I suspect it's because of the, the rapidity of the rollout that they wanted to have those assurances. But what we know is this is an ongoing process of testing the, uh, the, the uh, vaccines. And, uh, you know, these things are kept under review all the time by the scientists and indeed by the government and the Department for Health and Social Care. As has already been uh, mentioned by the Honourable Gentleman in opening the debate, um, the MHRA operates the Yellow Card Scheme to collect and monitor information on suspected safety concerns and a dedicated team of scientists review information daily to monitor the vaccine rollout. For this reason, it is not the view of myself nor His Majesty's opposition that the ask of this petition, namely a public inquiry into the COVID-19 vaccine safety, is a necessary one. Serious vaccine side effects are extremely rare and catching COVID-19 without vaccine protection remains overwhelmingly more dangerous than getting the vaccine itself. Where vaccine damage does tragically occur, it is right that individuals and their families can access the vaccine damage payment scheme, which I spoke at length about in September. Now, we must ensure that this very scheme uh, remains fit for the future. And uh, I did raise some concerns about that in the previous debate, uh, because it is important that those who are eligible can indeed access that financial support. I have to say, Sir Roger, that the petition claims, and I quote, that there has been a significant increase in heart attacks and related health issues since the COVID um, rollout of the vaccines began in 2021. I, I, I appreciate the strength of feeling of those who signed this petition. Uh, and I do want to understand more from the Minister about any investigations being undertaken by the health authorities and by scientists uh, in... I will give way. I thank the Shadow Minister for giving way. Didn't he? Was he not listening to... Uh, the Honourable Gentleman not listening to my speech. The report in Florida showed an 84% increase in death from cardiac arrest in men between the age of 18 and 39. I was indeed listening to his speech, and of course, if he'd let me finish the sentence, I said, I want to understand from the Minister about any investigations being undertaken by health authorities to ascertain whether this is actually the case, because there is conflicting information. I mean, the Honourable Gentleman talks about a study in Florida, and it's important that we take in, uh, into account all the information from across the globe, but the data in this country from the ONS, from the MHRA, and from no public health body actually backs that up. And that's why it's important that all of this data is kept under review and is actually scrutinised. And that's why I think it is important that the Minister gives us some assurances that that is being done. Now, as the government made clear in its response to the original petition, there are rare reports of myocarditis and pericarditis, which have informed product information advice for healthcare professionals and patients, as the Honourable Gentleman for Christchurch uh, pointed out to uh, the House. However, it is worth reinforcing just how rare these specific adverse reactions are. Across all vaccines used in the UK, there has been a reporting rate of just 0.01% for myocarditis and for pericarditis. And even where this side effect has occurred, most cases have been mild and individuals have recovered. There is an awful lot of misinformation regarding vaccine efficacy and safety. It's therefore vital that any debate about vaccine safety is led by the facts. I would therefore ask the Minister if she can set out in her response what action 
she will be taking to tackle vaccine misinformation and to provide accurate reassurance to those who remain hesitant? And how will she get robust data out there for proper and effective public scrutiny that we can then hopefully reinforce that efficacy? I hear a lot in my capacity as Shadow Public Health Minister about concerns relating to yellow card reports. To that, I would just reiterate MHRA guidance, which clearly states, and I quote, that many suspected ADRs reported on a yellow card do not have any relation to the vaccine or medicine. The yellow card reporting scheme allows individuals and health professionals to report any suspected reactions or side effects, even if the reporter isn't sure what caused uh, it was caused by the vaccine. It is often the case that events recorded via the yellow card scheme would have happened anyway. Now, I feel very passionately about tackling vaccine misinformation head on because the truth is we are not in a position to be complacent. Within the UK, there are still people dying because they have not been vaccinated and uptake among certain communities is still far too low. But the challenge is also global. There are over 20 nations across the world, Sir Roger, who have uh, first dose vaccine rates lower than 20%. In a country like Burundi, for example, just 0.2% of people have received their first dose. The United Kingdom has an important role to play in ensuring low-income countries can access vaccines, but also in making the argument, domestically and on the world stage, that vaccines are safe and they are effective. This not only ensures that we remain better protected against COVID-19 and potential mutations, but also against future pandemics, where trust is a key tool in protecting people and communities across the globe. In conclusion, Sir Roger, this has been an important and a wide-ranging debate, and one that I am glad we were able to facilitate. We in this House may have different views on uh, this particular subject, but we also have a responsibility to protect the public health of the people we represent, and that means using our platforms to make it clear that COVID-19 vaccines are safe and they are effective, something that I'm sure the Minister will wholeheartedly agree with. Minister, Dr Caroline Johnson. Thank you, Sir Roger. It's a pleasure to check again with your chairmanship. Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank my honourable friend, the member for Carl Shelton and Washington, Wallington, for his kind words regarding the COVID vaccine programme and for bringing this important and timely debate to this House. And it is timely because we started the COVID-19 Boosters Autumn Scheme just a few weeks ago. Um, before I respond to the points, and I will try and answer all the questions, if I can, made by honourable members, um, I want to thank uh, the members for their support of the vaccine scheme, particularly those on opposition benches from Denton and Redditch and Coatbridge, Criston and Bells Hill. Um, I'd also like to thank each and every person in the country who's come forward for their jabs, as well as the tens of thousands of NHS staff and volunteers who made this happen. Um, my honourable friend from Carl Shelton and Wallington asked why the vaccine programme had worked so well. And indeed, it worked so well due to the dedication and hard work of all that were involved in it, um, from the government to the NHS to volunteers to pharma. And I was honoured to volunteer myself alongside people from my local area as young as 15 and as old as in their 80s. It was truly a community effort. Um, the take-up of the COVID-19 vaccine has been huge, and over 151 million vaccines have been delivered in the UK meaning over 90% of people aged 12 and over have received at least one dose, and more than 40 million have received a booster or third dose. We've also made a great start to the autumn booster campaign. Since the start of the campaign on September the 5th in England, more than 10 million people have stepped forward for their jab. Our safe and effective vaccines have underpinned the government's strategy for living with COVID-19. They allowed the economy and society to reopen, and the country's ability to live with the virus in the future will continue to depend on deeper and broader population immunity. Critically, they have also reduced the pressure on the National Health Service and allowed us to start to tackle the elective care backlog. 
Vaccines remain our biggest line of defence as we head into a challenging winter period. Vaccinated people are less likely to get seriously ill with COVID-19 or seasonal flu or be admitted to be hospital. And there is also evidence that they're less likely to pass the virus on to others. We know the COVID vaccine has saved tens of thousands of lives. That's tens of thousands of mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, sisters, brothers, sons and daughters who are thankfully still with us. But is she aware that the excess deaths this year run somewhere, two different sets of figures, between 18 and 25,000 excess deaths this year alone? I think, I think my honourable friend for his point, I'm referring here to the COVID vaccine which has saved uh, hundreds of thousands of lives. I take his point about that, but there's no evidence that that was caused by a COVID vaccine. Um, I would like to acknowledge and pass on my sympathies to the very small number of people for whom vaccines may not have worked as intended and who may have suffered an adverse reaction from vaccines as a result. I want to turn to vaccine safety, the topic of this debate. All of the vaccines used in the UK COVID-19 vaccine programme are safe. We have in the UK some of the highest safety standards in the world and the MHRA is globally recognised for high standards of quality, safety and medicines regulation. Each COVID-19 vaccine candidate is assessed by teams of scientists and clinicians on a case-by-case -case basis, and there are extensive checks and balances at every stage of vaccine development. It is only once each potential vaccine has met robust standards of effectiveness, safety, and quality set by the MHRA that it will be approved for use. It is also important to st stress that surveillance of vaccine safety and adverse <coughs> reactions does not stop once a vaccine has been approved. The MHRA and the UK Health Security Agency are constantly reviewing a wide range of available data regarding the safety of vaccines, including the reports of adverse reactions from the UK and international reports. I wonder if the honourable... My, my I will, of course. Uh, uh, I'm grateful okay. to my honourable friend for giving way. Um, people outside this house won't know that she, although she's been in her job a relatively short time, is a remarkably dedicated and d diligent person. And there is no minister who will be more likely or determined to get to those facts when she's looking at international data than she will. So will she just give the assurance that she will consider all the information available, including that international data, in drawing conclusions about the content of this debate and the case that's been made by many of my constituents and others? Minister. I thank my honourable friend and for his very kind uh, words. I will, of course, look... I saw the evidence. The honourable, right honourable uh, gentleman is aware of my experience as a clinician and knows that I will always look at an evidence-based uh, <coughs> medical process. Um, as part of the surveillance into currently used medicines and vaccines, the MHRA continues to review all the suspected adverse drug reaction reports, known as the yellow cards reports, relating to COVID vaccines, and which have been mentioned by honourable members and right honourable members throughout the debate. Through the MHRA Yellow Card Scheme, members of the public and healthcare professionals are able to report any suspected side effects. The comprehensive surveillance strategy alerts us to any unforeseen adverse reactions to the vaccine to enable us to act swiftly when required. In April 2021, we quickly responded to reports of extremely rare cases of concurrent thrombosis and thrombocytopenia following vaccination with the first dose of AstraZeneca. And the JCVI at that point advised that adults under 30 without underlying health issues should be offered an alternative vaccine to the AstraZeneca if one was available. This was later extended again in May 2021 to adults under 40 without underlying health issues. The MHRA, as my honourable friend from um, North West Leicester just said, have taken a thorough review in the UK to reports of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. While the estimated incident rate has increased over time as awareness of the condition increases across the healthcare system, the number of cases remains extremely low given that over 49 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine AstraZeneca have been uh, administered. Um, a number of honourable um, colleagues asked about um, myocarditis. There is no evidence that people are at increased risk of cardiac arrest in the days or weeks following the vaccine and the risk of getting myocarditis or pericarditis after the vaccine remains very low. A large study of 4 million vaccinated people in Denmark, published in the British Medical Journal, found there were no deaths or diagnoses of heart failure in people who were diagnosed with myocarditis or pericarditis after being vaccinated. 
in the highest risk group of those aged 18 to 29 up until the end of September this year. There were 29 cases for every million second Pfizer doses and 68 cases for every million second Moderna doses given in the UK. These risks were much lower after a um, booster dose and in other grade groups the risk is lower still. However, catching COVID-19 on the other hand, and it's worth remembering this, catching COVID-19 on the other hand can significantly increase your risk of cardiac arrest and death and the risk of uh, developing myocarditis. There were an estimated 1,500 cases of myocarditis per million patients with COVID, far greater than the risk of myocarditis following vaccination. And I wanted to go uh, at this point to some of the questions that have been asked. And my honourable friend from Cosh Elton, Washington, asked about uh, the inquiry and how people will be able to uh, contribute to the inquiry. The inquiry will listen and consider carefully the experiences of bereaved families and others who've suffered loss as a result of the pandemic, but it's not going to consider individual cases. Rather, it, listening to these accounts will inform its understanding of the impact of the pandemic and the response and any lessons to be learned. Individuals will be able to engage through the inquiry's listening exercise and the details of that will be um, brought forward in due course. Um, my honourable friend from Christchurch asked about informed consent and indeed I think he produced the leaflet uh, that provides that informed consent um, that allows people to understand um, that the JCVI have on balance recommended a vaccine because it is on balance beneficial to people. It's more likely to be of, of, of benefit to them than harm. But equally, each individual will be provided with information about the vaccine, as they are with all medical treatments, so that they know the benefits that they may expect and also the risk of side effects, however small and what they are. And, and he's produced an example in this um, debate of, of such thing. It's what's important is that people are aware of the benefits, the risks, and are able to make informed decisions for themselves. And vaccination is not compulsory, but we are aware that it's of great benefit to the population and to individuals at, at risk of COVID. I will. I'm, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to the, the, the Minister. So what happens if somebody suffers a 50% disability as a result of having the vaccine, an adverse reaction, an unusual event, what does the government do to help that person? It doesn't provide any compensation. It doesn't provide any special help through the health service. It doesn't provide a clinic. What does it do to help those people? Uh, thank my friend for his question. So he's talking about the vaccine um, um, payment scheme, vaccine damage payment scheme, which has been running since 1979, which um, looks at providing a payment, which is a tax-free lump sum one-off payment of up to £120,000 for people who have been severely damaged um, by uh, vaccines on the balance of probabilities, and that's something that's determined and people apply for that. Um, the, that does not prejudice any claim that they may have in a legal sense, and they can still, can still pursue a civil claim uh, should they wish uh, to, do, to do so. Um, there has been consideration of whether to, um, uh, our friends have asked about whether there should be a separate scheme for COVID, but of course it's, it's right that all vaccines are treated in a similar uh, fashion. Um, my honourable friend from Devizes asked a few questions. Um, he asked me about the terms of reference of being a matter for the chair, which indeed uh, they are. Um, he also asked me whether I would commit the chair of the MHRA to meet uh, with specific people, but that is not for me. That's up to the, uh, the chair to, to do so, not me. Um, the other question he asked was about children's vaccines, and he's aware of my thoughts on children's vaccines. It's very important that when we vaccinate particularly children that the vaccines are of benefit to the child uh, themselves. Um, I'm aware that at the time the vaccine was approved that was the um, decision made by all four chief medical officers and it's very important that government listens to and takes medical advice. Um, since then um, some things have changed. Immunity is more widespread, natural immunity and school disruption is no longer um, uh, an, an issue. Uh, so I, I understand that the JCVI will be looking uh, very shortly at their next meeting into whether children's vaccines should still continue to be re recommended on the basis of the um, current situation. I think it's right that um, medical research, as it, as it becomes more available, is regularly uh, reviewed and, and, and taken into account. Um, the position of the MHRA remains that the benefits of COVID-19 vaccine continue to outweigh the risk of, uh, risks for most people. The surveillance strategy is working, as we've discussed. We're able to respond quickly to ensure safe administration of all COVID vaccines. And I would like to reiterate that the public should be very confident that all tests are completed to the very highest standards and that vaccines are safe. Mr Chairman, despite the progress that we have made, we must not well, become complacent. Well, 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 my honourable friend, the 
all-party parliamentary group for victims of vaccine damage, would he be willing to come and address that group um, in a private meeting so she can hear firsthand some of the concerns that members have got? I think my, I'm friend for the question. Um, he'll be aware of events today, and I will have to um, at least see whether I remain in post before committing, committing um, potentially somebody else to uh, such a decision. Um, Mr Chairman, despite the progress we've made, we haven't got to become complacent. We can't risk an increase in serious illness, hospitalisations and deaths from COVID. Um, the UK HSA estimated that even by the end of September 2021, vaccinations had averted up to 128,000 deaths and 262,000 hospitalisations, and there will be many more uh, since then. We must do everything in our power to protect those most vulnerable to the virus and keep pressure off the NHS in a tough winter period. Viruses like COVID-19 spread much more easily in winter when we socialise indoors. To protect those most at risk and help reduce pressure on the NHS, we are delivering an autumn booster dose to those who are most in need of an extra layer of protection. Even if someone has had all their jabs so far, and perhaps had COVID too, they may still need an autumn booster to strengthen their protection. If eligible, I would encourage everyone to come forward for their COVID booster and seasonal flu jab today. To encourage vaccination against COVID, flu and boost uptake, the NHS is making every effort to make it as convenient as possible for individuals to take up the offer including offering both COVID and flu vaccines at the same time where possible to reduce the number of appointments needed. Our NHS staff and volunteers are pulling out all the stops to deliver the next phase of the COVID vaccine programme at speed, once again with more than 3,000 sites up and down the country involved. The NHS was the first healthcare system in the world to deliver a COVID-19 vaccine outside clinical trials, and it is now the first to deliver the new variant busting scheme. Bivalent vaccines target two different strains of COVID-19 and they will give us a broader immunity and therefore potentially improve protection against variants of the virus. Whatever vaccine people receive in the Autumn Booster Programme, they can be assured it remains effective at preventing severe disease against all current variants and any potential future variants. As I draw to a close, I would like to thank my honourable friend, the member for Carl Shelton and Wallington, for bringing this important debate to this House at such an important time. The government has already commissioned a public inquiry into the pandemic and COVID vaccines will be reviewed as part of this inquiry. There are no plans for an inquiry solely on vaccine safety. We're facing a tough winter ahead and collectively we must do everything we can to protect those most vulnerable and to reduce pressure on the National Health Service. I would encourage everyone eligible to step forward for their COVID and flu vaccines as soon as they are available. Thank you, Sir Roger. It's unusual that I'm in this place and I get lambasted by colleagues, but uh, I make no apology, Sir Roger, for looking out for the health and well-being of my constituents. And I completely agree with the sentiments raised throughout the course of th this afternoon's debate that we do have to do more, and I do urge the Minister to look into more what we can do for those and, uh, who are adversely affected. But the thing that I will not apologise for is not allowing that to be a gateway to allow vaccine misinformation to come in to, main, to the mainstream. Um, some people have said that this debate is overdue. Well, I hasten to remind colleagues in my opening remarks, there has been four of these petitions committee debates alone, let alone the backbench business debates and private colleagues um, that have come forward to um, uh, ask for debates. So there, this is not overdue. This has happened plenty of times. We've given a lot of parliamentary time to this. Um, yes, there is more that we can and must do for those that suffer harm. Um, but it is worth reiterating that the system for approving and monitoring vaccines is robust. The inquiry exists already. And vaccines are a great British success story. It was a Brit that discovered vaccines in the way that we know them today and that they have been effective in tackling a range of illnesses that would have previously been life-threatening or very dangerous indeed. The proof is that they work, that they, are save, that they are saving lives, and they protect yourself and others. So can I join the Minister in urging people to come forward for their vaccines this winter, help protect themselves, help protect, them, help protect others, and help make sure that the strain on our NHS is as minimal as possible. I beg to move. Petition 602171 relating to the safety of COVID-19 vaccines. As many of that have been say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Order, order.